Cambridge IGCSE Physics Major 2020 Paper 43 Part 2 Question 6 Part A Figure 6.1 shows crests of a sound wave after reflection from a solid surface. On Figure 6.1, draw three crests of the incident wave. These are the reflected wave. We need to draw where the wave initially came from. Well, to do that, you first need to draw a normal. Alright then, since it's just a reflection, the angle of incidence should equal to the angle of reflection. Since this is the angle of reflection, the angle of incidence should be somewhere over here like this. Then if we draw the initial wave according to the angle, it will be like this. Same thing, you draw another line like this. Then all you need to do is erase these lines of normal and just leave it like this. So you have to be careful that you just draw only three, don't need to draw so many. And these wave fronts should be parallel to each other. And also the wavelengths, which are these, should be equal to the wavelengths of the reflected wave. Part B. Take four statements in the list below that are false for a sound wave that is audible to a healthy human ear. Humans can hear longitudinal waves. Sound waves are longitudinal, so it makes sense. So it's not false, but humans cannot hear transverse waves. Transverse waves are like electromagnetic waves, such as the microwave or the radio wave. We can never hear those. So this is false. The frequency of the wave is 1 hertz. Okay, the range that humans can hear is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Therefore, if it's 1 hertz, it's not in this range, so it's wrong, it's false. If it's 1 kilohertz, it's in the range, so it's correct. We don't need to tick it. Then the frequency of the wave is 1 megahertz. This is also outside the range, so it's wrong. The wave travels in a vacuum. If the sound wave is in a vacuum, we cannot hear it, so it's wrong. The wave could travel in aluminum. This has nothing to do with the sound wave. It can still be heard, so it's correct. Part C. State a typical value for the speed of a sound wave in water. While the speed of a sound wave in air is around 340 meters per second, if it's in water, it's 1,500 meters per second. You need to memorize these numbers. Question 7. Figure 7.1 shows red light traveling from air into a prism made of diamond. The path of the red light is incomplete. Part A. The refractive index of diamond is 2.42. Calculate angle X. Alright. The formula related to refractive index, often written as N, is N equals to sine I over sine R. Sine I is the sine of the incident angle. In this case, 40 degrees is here. Well, be careful, this is not the incident angle. The incident angle is something between the ray and the normal, so it's this. Well, you know that the normal and the surface always makes 90 degrees. So the angle for the incidence is 90 minus 40 equals to 50 degrees. So the angle of incidence is 50 degrees. And the angle of refraction is here, it's x, the angle that we're supposed to find. If you write this in an equation, it's 2.42 equals to sine 50 degrees over sine x. Then sine x equals to sine 50 over 2.42. x equals to sine inverse of sine 50 and 2.42. To calculate it, you get 18.45 for something something, just rounding up to 18 degrees. So the angle acts as 18 degrees. Part B. Explain the term total internal reflection. Right, this is a definition that you must remember. This occurs when light is traveling from optically dense medium to optically less dense medium. The result is that all light will be reflected and it can only happen when the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. 
Part C. The angle Y is greater than the critical angle of diamond. Oh, this is the angle Y. On figure 7.1, draw the path of the red light through and out of the prism after point A. We need to draw two paths. So the first one is the red light through the prism and the second one is when it goes out of the prism. And since this angle is greater than the critical angle, and since prism is more dense than the air, total internal reflection will occur and all light is going to be reflected. If that happens, we have to roughly estimate the angle of reflection, probably like this, then total internal reflection, so everything is reflected, so a straight line should be drawn like this. Well, you don't need to use a protractor or anything. If you want to be more accurate, then you can do that. But it just needs to roughly look like they're the same angles. We've drawn the first part of the question. Then secondly, we have to draw the ray going out of the prism. Well, this time it won't be the total internal reflection. It's just going to be refraction. I recommend drawing the normal first to be accurate. You know, you don't need to be that accurate, but you still need some kind of accuracy. The angle of refraction will be bigger than this, so probably going to be something like this. And if you draw it, the refracted ray will be like this. Kate put some arrows to show the direction, and it's done. Since it's from a diamond, an optically dense medium to the air less optically dense medium, the refracted ray will bend away from the normal in this direction. So yeah, you also need to remember that point. You have to remember does the reflected ray goes towards the normal or away from the normal. It's really up to you to memorize that. Question 8 Part A. Describe what is meant by an electric field. Another definition, it's the region in which an electric charge experiences a force. Make sure you include every single word of the sentence. They are all important. State what is meant by the direction of an electric field. We just said that it's where it experiences a force, so the direction stands for the direction of force on a positive charge. Part B. Figure 8.1 shows a polystyrene ball covered with aluminum paint. The polystyrene ball is suspended between two charged metal plates by an insulated thread. So the positively charged metal plate, negatively charged metal plate, and polystyrene ball is here covered with aluminum paint. The ball oscillates between the two charged plates. Explain why the ball oscillates. Okay, so let's say the ball moves towards the positive plate first. When it moves here, it's gonna touch the positively charged metal plate. And because it's covered in aluminum, which is the conducting material, it's going to be positively charged as well. Once it gets positively charged, it's going to be repelled by the positively charged metal plate because they're the same charge and like charges repel. So once it's repelled, it will move to the negatively charged metal plate carrying the positive charges. Okay, once it touches the negatively charged metal plate, it's going to lose its charge. That is because the negatively charged metal plate will start giving its negative charges to the ball and everything's going to be neutralized. Then at one point, it's going to have much more negative charges on the ball than it's going to be negatively charged overall and it will start to move towards the positively charged metal plate again. So that's why you'll see it keep moving and so on and oscillating in the end. Part C. There is a current of 0.29 amperes in an electrical circuit. Calculate the time taken for a charge of 15 coulombs to flow through the electrical circuit. We're given a current in the charge and we need to find the time. So we'll have to use the formula I equals to Q over T, which is current equals to charge over time. And since we're finding the time, rearrange it. Time equals to charge over current. This is then 15 divided by 0 
you get 51.724 and so on. Just run it up to 2SF, it's 52 seconds. Question 9. Figure 9.1 shows a simple direct circuit DC electric motor. The coil rotates about the axis when there is a current in the coil. The coil is connected to the rest of the circuit by the brushes. Part A. On figure 9.1, draw a pair of arrows to show which way the coil rotates. Explain the direction you have chosen. So firstly, you have to draw the arrows and then explain why that is your answer. Okay, this one, you have to use the Fleming's left hand rule. If you see a DC motor, electric motor, and these magnets, you should automatically know that you're supposed to use the Fleming's left hand rule. First of all, the direction of the magnetic field, that your second finger is from the north side to the south pole, it's like this. And since current flows from the positive to the negative junction, it's gonna flow in this direction. Okay, and for this, you have to first think of one side of the circuit and then the next side of the circuit. So we're gonna look at this side first. The direction of the magnetic field is from left to right and the current is from here to here like this this is the overall direction so if you use your finger use your hand to do it you'll know that it's going downwards so this left side of the circuit motion is towards the bottom okay i hope you guys can imagine what i'm talking about the diagram looks super messy tell me in the comments if you can't get it i'll try to explain in words again and okay let's do the right side so this is the side that we're looking at. This time, direction of the magnetic field is still from left to right, from the north to the south pole. However, the direction of the current is changed. You can see that it's coming from the magnets towards the circuit like this. So it's in opposite direction. So if you use your fingers once again, do it in this way, you can notice that the motion is towards the top. It's actually in accordance to this diagram. Just like this, it's an upward motion. Then finally, from these two arrows, if you just think about these arrows, the left side is going down and the right side is going up, which means that this will rotate in this direction, the anti-clockwise direction. So you can draw this on the figure like this. Then to explain it, you first need to talk about the direction of the current that it flows from the positive to the negative side of the circuit. So for the left side, the current is traveling towards the magnet and for the right side, the current is traveling towards the circuit. And so the force on the left is going downwards and the force on the right is going upwards. So it's the anti-clockwise rotation. To solve this kind of question, first divide your diagram to half, then just look at the left side first and then the right side because the direction of the current on the left side and the right side is different, so the direction of force will be different. Then with the two forces you have found out, deduce the direction of the rotation. In this question, it was anticlockwise rotation. On figure 9.1, draw an arrow to show the direction in which electrons flow through the coil. Okay, the direction of the electrons. Well, I've just said that current flows from the positive to the negative charge in the circuit, but for the electrons, they travel in an opposite direction of the current. So they will travel from the negative charge to the positive charge of the coil. You can draw it like this. Explain why the electrons flow in the direction you've shown in part A2. Electrons flow in the opposite direction of the current, and that is because the electrons are negative and they're repelled from the negative connection of supply. So if you have electrons like this, they will obviously be repelled from the negative charge and start moving like this, like this, and so on, and that's why they move in this direction.
Part B state any difference each of the following changes makes to the rotation of the coil in figure 9.1, changing the polarity of the power supply to that shown in figure 9.2. Changing the polarity means the current will start traveling in this way, while the direction of the current is changed, so the rotation will occur in an opposite direction. Changing the coil to the new coil shown in figure 9.2. The original coil has one loop, but the new coil has two loops. So this is going to make the coil turn faster. If there are more number of coils, there will be greater moment or turning effect, so it will turn faster. Then using a stronger magnetic field. Okay, this is also one of the ways to make the coil rotate faster. You either have a stronger magnetic field, or a stronger current, or more number of coils, then it's gonna turn faster. Question 10, Part A. A radioactive nucleus of carbon decays to a nucleus of nitrogen by emitting a particle. Complete the nuclide equation and state the name of the particle. This is actually simple maths. 14 became 14, meaning X has 0. Then 6 became 7, so x should have negative 1 to make it 6. And the name of particle x, x0, negative 1, this is a beta particle. Part B, a radiation detector in a laboratory records the reading of 10 counts per minute. There are no radioactive samples in the laboratory. Explain why the radiation detector records a reading and suggest a possible source. This is because there's something called background radiation. So even though there's no significant radiation source, radiation is emitted from random objects like the rocks, the ground. It just exists in air or in food. So it can still be recorded in this laboratory. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. There are atoms of carbon-14 in all living organisms. An archaeologist digs up some ancient wood in the same laboratory as in Part B1. A sample of this ancient wood gives a reading of 20 counts per minute. An equivalent sample of living wood gives a reading of 80 counts per minute. It is suggested that the age of the ancient sample is 11,400 years. Do a calculation to check whether this suggestion is correct. The first thing we have to take note is that the background radiation was 10 counts per minute. So even though the readings was 20 and 80, in reality, they are actually 10 counts per minute and 70 counts per minute. Put this here to show that you know about the background radiation and you have calculated according to it. So now we're just going to use these two numbers. Its half-life is 5,700 years, and they guess that the age of this ancient sample is 11,400 years. So they're assuming that it has went through two half-lives, because 5,700 times 2 equals to 11,400 years, and we have to check if that makes sense. Well, since the readings taken was 10 counts per minute from the ancient wood, and originally it's 70, we have to check its half-lives using these numbers. So let's say from 70, after one half-life, it will become 35. And after another half-life, it will become 17.5. Okay, so this is the first half-life and this is the second half-life. But even after the second half-life, it's still higher than 10 over here. Which means that it has went through another half-life. So third half-life, it'll be 8.725. But this time, it's a bit lower than 10 counts per minute. So we can assume that this ancient wood went through more than two half-lives, but still less than three. It can be like 2.5 or 2.7, but it's still not two half-lives. So the assumption that it has went through two half-lives and its age is 11,400 years is wrong. And you have to state that the age of this ancient wood should be higher than two half-lives. So higher than 11,400 years. All right, that's it for this video. If this video helped you, please like and leave a comment. I love reading your comments and I'll reply ASAP. So feel free to do that. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to get ready for your IGCSE exams.
Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye.